My name is Asha Nilbar. I am a faculty member here, direct the graduate program as well as the Excel Studies program. I will tell you a little bit about both of these, but mostly about the Excel Studies program and, and uh, set the event that we are having today within the context of what we are doing in terms of Excel Studies. But before, before I do that, I would like to introduce you to my two fine friends and colleagues and ask them to say a couple of words to greet you here and maybe talk to you about other events which are related to what we are doing today <coughs> and tell you a little bit more about those events. So if you choose so and have the time, you can have the chance to attend those events. Uh, this event is co-hosted by the Department of English, and we have Dr. J uh, James Sutton here, the chair of the department, who will also welcome you. And we have also Professor uh, Michael Gillespie, who is the director of the Center for the Humanities and uh, in an urban environment in Miami, and will also tell you a little bit more about the center and how we all fit in <coughs> together. So I will call first Dr. Sutton to say a few welcoming words, and then Dr. Gillespie. Thank you, Dr. Nafar. I'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight. Um, Dr. Melvaro will tell you more about how this is the first in what we hope will be a number of conversations that will uh, come about over the course of the next couple of, of years. Um, and we're, we're really eager to inaugurate this program this evening. So thank you so much. And I won't even introduce our two fine gentlemen. I'll let Dr. Melvaro do that. I'm the chair in the English department. It's always a pleasure to work with Dr. Milbauer in the Exile Studies Program in the Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment. Um, I told him I was going to be brief because we all know brevity is the soul of wit. I'm not always that good at being brief, so I will just mention a couple of things coming up in the English department and then allow Dr. Gillespie, I'm sure, to mention a few other things because we always have great things going on at the university and in our programs. Um, Next week on Tuesday, the Department of English will be uh, hosting a faculty member from Duke University, Dr. Judith Ruderman, who will be delivering the first and what we hope to be an annual event, a, a sort of signature literature program event, uh, the Butler Waugh Memorial Lecture. Uh, she'll be speaking about D.H. Lawrence next Tuesday. <coughs> Look for information about that in uh, various media, Facebook. If you're a student, you'll probably be getting various communications about that. Um, and way, 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 way in the distance, <coughs> but not so far in the distance that I'm not already thinking about it. Um, and I'll be talking about this quite a bit in the course of the next 10 months. And in fact, what I'm about to announce will have the um, the support of the Betsy South Beach, the Betsy Hotel on um, uh, Collins Avenue, which is how we got to know Pablo. Um, I'm referring to the residency of Shakespeare's first folio here at FIU next February. We just found out today, actually a few days ago, in a month we're going to get the first folio. So if you are like me, I hope there are at least a few of you like me, who are Shakespeare nuts. Um, February of 2016 is going to be a huge sort of Shakespearean celebration, not only at the university, but I hope in the, in the wider South Florida community. So put that um, in your, your mental calendar and expect to hear much more about that. But you didn't come tonight for Shakespeare or for to hear about D.H. Lawrence next week. Um, you came to hear these two fine gentlemen um, inaugurate our series of conversations uh, around the issues of, of exile promoted by the Exile Studies Program and the Center for the Humanities and the Urban Environment. So let me ask Dr. Gillespie, our Director of the Humanities Center, to also come up and say a few words and tell you about other things that are soon to happen. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. I'm the 30-second clip. 
that appears in front of the YouTube, uh, the YouTube film that you want to see. Unfortunately, there's no tab in the left that says skip this ad. <laughs> to what I'm going to say. First, I, I do want to uh, thank Professor Milbauer and the Exile Studies Program for letting us, uh, the Center for the Humanities and an Urban Environment, co-sponsor this event. I think it's a terrific, it's going to be a terrific evening and the start of a, of a terrific series of conversations, intergenerational conversations on the topic of exile, which is so important to all of us here in Miami. Along those lines, um, Wednesday afternoon, the uh, center is sponsoring a panel discussion on immigration reform. It features uh, Archbishop Wensky, Helen Ferre, the, uh, the, the a very well-known journalist, Gypsy Metellus, who heads the Haitian Community Center, and Delia Walker Huntington, an immigration lawyer from Broward uh, County. Uh, it is in, uh, in this room at GL220 at 2 p.m. Wednesday afternoon, free and open to the public. Uh, C-SPAN will be recording it, so if you'd like to make your television debut, this is a good place to come with a question. Uh, the, 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 our presenters, the panelists, will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have 40 minutes for Q&A. I hope to see you all there. I'll leave some of the flyers on the table uh, uh, near the door so you can pick them up on the way out. Thank you again for coming tonight. It's going to be a terrific evening. Okay. <coughs> Let me set the event within the context of what we are doing. As I told you a little bit earlier, I direct the Exile Studies Program, a program which was established about four years ago, and which has been going quite strong now, and it's taking on a life of its own, so to speak. The program that we are having today, the Intergenerational Conversations, is one of the elements of what we are doing in Exile Studies. Uh, we, of course, offer something that no one actually offers yet in this country or to the best of our knowledge in, uh, in the world, in the academic world. We offer a certificate of exile studies. A number of people who are in the certificate program are present today. And that program has been also going very strong. It's an 18 credit program, which is interdisciplinary, but deeply anchored in uh, literary studies. So that's one of the elements of the Excel Studies program that we have here. Uh, there is a seat right here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the yeah. <laughs> I see the semblance there. Uh, another, another element of the program that we are uh, offering is uh, annual lecture series on different kinds of subjects, for example, a series on exile and totalitarianism, which is very much in line with what we are going to talk to uh, today about. And we invite major scholars from all over the world to participate in that program. Another, another lecture series we ran was Exile, Creativity, and Patronage. I don't want to spend time enumerating all of these, but I know you are here because you are interested. So I'm interested in sharing with you these kinds of things. So we have the lecture series, and now we have also a fascinating, fascinating program that we have established together with the Betsy Hotel, and Pablo is very instrumental in making sure that the program is running well and is intellectually challenging and also intellectually enriching. And that is we have the Betsy Betsy Hotel, South Beach, the Betsy FIU Exile Study Scholar uh, right in residence. And we have, uh, we have already three residents uh, in 13, 14, and just in 2015, we had a residence, a famous writer, Romanian American writer from Bard College. They stay at the Betsy Hotel for 10 days usually they are well taken care of and they share their views on exile, they, they uh, give lectures and so on. And that's another program. And today we are actually inaugurating a new program and that is 
one that is dealing with intergenerational conversations, with exilic experiences, and I'm extremely happy that uh, Mr. Guillermo Cartaya and Mr. Pablo Cartaya have agreed to be the first to introduce what we hope to be a event that we will be offering uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, let me direct a little traffic we have here. Yeah, there's another seat up there. Right. And, uh, we have some, some, right here. We have some more chairs. genesis of it and the root of that program is in classes that we offer in Excel studies. And the classes that we offer very often lead to conversations between first professor and students and of course the major conversation between text and student. And uh, just recently, and we are continuing to do so, we have been reading a novel by Cristina Garcia, Dreaming in Cuban. Mm -hmm. where you deal with three generations of Cuban women mostly here, the men seem to be quite insignificant there, <laughs> or they serve a particular purpose only. <laughs> the women like that purpose. <laughs> At any rate, they, there are conversations, intergenerational conversations there. And this seems to be a running motif in exile literature in general, and in Cuban American literature in particular. I just finished a book by Uva de Aragon, who was the associate director of the uh, Cuban Research Institute here. And it's a book about, it's called The Memory of Silence. And it is about two sisters, one in Cuba, one in Miami, who are having this kind of a conversation. So this is what we have here today. When we teach this kind of literature, our own students are engaging very often on an introspective kind of a journey. And they discover things about themselves and about their parents that without reading those books, they will never be able to discover. So we are celebrating the books, celebrating the protagonists, and today we are celebrating our major protagonists here. So let me quickly introduce them, and then they will start a conversation. A <coughs> fireside chat, you want to call it whichever way, and we hope that we will learn a great deal from what transpires today. Uh, Mr. Guillermo Cartaya, who I met on a number of occasions and very much enjoyed the conversations that we had most of the time at the Betsy Hotel. And I told him on one occasion, you shouldn't come to, you should come and talk to my students. They're a fascinating man, you have a lot to share, you have to come and share it with the students. That's how it all started. But then of course I also knew Pablo, who is a noted writer, and he is managing the programs, literary programs at the Betsy Hotel. And from the conversation with Mr. Cartaya Sr., it went to Pablo, and that's how this event came about. Mr. Guillermo Cartaya had a wonderful, still having a wonderful and complicated life as an exile. He told us today twice in exile, and he will explain, I'm sure, what he means by that and uh, had an illustrious career in Cuba as a banker, a businessman, and then he had to participate in something which brings back different kinds of memories, including traumatic memories in the Bay of Pig invasion, and then created a career in the family and a good life for himself in America, which is not a bad exile to be in, <laughs> but nevertheless, it is still not something that one desires for himself because it is an unnatural state of existence. He worked in banking, in investment banking, dealt with different kinds of entities, and developed banks, and he also was a speaker at Princeton, at, uh, at uh, uh, Harvard for College, and at other universities, and I'm very glad that you are here today to share your wisdom with us. Now, he did very well, Mr. Cartaya, Guillermo Cartaya, because he gave us Pablo Cartaya too with his mother, and I'm very glad that Pablo is here. I got to know Pablo quite well in the recent years, and I'm always impressed by his intellect, by his insights, literary insights, and what he is able to do in the communities 
and promote the kind of events that he's promoting and participating in. Pablo has what I really value, an inherited sense of exile. He has insights into the exilic condition that I rarely uh, see in, in people. But I also like to talk to him about other things that he is doing. He is a noted writer. He is a published author and novelist. He's writing and got a contract now on the novel about the uh, uh, Bay of Pigs. But he also has just gotten two wonderful contracts, great news on publishing his novels about um, young adults, which is a very difficult kind of a genre. Can you imagine to be able to satisfy those ten teenagers in a way? It's a tall, tall, tall duty. But he's got a contract with Penguin, and uh, we all look forward to reading the books, promoting them here too, and most importantly, we look forward to listening to you today. So now you have a chance to ask each other whatever you <coughs> wanted to ask but never did in the past. Wow. Please, well, can you have a challenge now? So, <laughs> Before I let them talk, I also want to mention one thing. The lecture series gives rise to a lot of good things. One of our first lecturers was Dr. Gillespie. What is Dr. Gillespie? Right there. He gave one of the first lectures in the Exile Studies series. And since then, he was working also on a book that came out, uh, that came about as a result of his starting to work in the field of exile. And I want to congratulate Dr. Gillespie. Today, he presented me with the volume that he has published. It's a new book on James Joyce and Exile. Congratulations. Well, with such a, uh, a warm and thoughtful introduction, I, I think I think Asher, you've set the bar a bit too high for me. I think. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of my, about my background before, and then we can then we'll delve into the conversation uh, when. When Asher gave me the call about about this program, you know we do so many things through the Betsy with with FIU, so many wonderful things, and you know with uh, Dr. Sutton and Dr. Gillespie and, and Asher, it's a very special relationship because we're we're building together important programs that cover a lot of aspects of what you know our community is doing, a lot of um, literary events, but also human events and like like we said we've we've partnered on a few writers in residence um, and have had really rich programs that are that, that really bring a voice to uh, a fascinating aspect of our community um, so I, I think that before we begin I, I think it's important for me to give you a little bit about my own background and my own experience as an exile and then and then if my father will allow me I'll, I'll pepper him with some questions and maybe he can shed some light on some things that, you know, since it's now we're in front of everybody, now you have to answer the question. Um, no, he's, he's always very warm and, and open to that. Um, my, my experience has, has been an interesting one. I, you know, I recall when I was a kid, um, I recall one of my first grade, first grade teachers, uh, when he called my name, he said, you know, what's your name? And I said, Pablo. And he said, oh, like Paul. And I said, no, like Picasso. And it was an interesting thing. And it's you know, maybe a little smart alecky of me. But, but it, it, I've been thinking a lot about this, this um, experience of my own identity, my own cultural identity. And at, in that journey, I recall that moment. And then later on, I, um, when, I, when I went to um, pursue a career in acting in Los Angeles, that was a whole other, that was another experience that I had, which was going to auditions and having casting directors tell me, you know, why is your name Pablo? You don't look like a Mexican. Um, or going into a Spanish language, because I'm, I'm bilingual, going to a Spanish language audition and saying, you know, you don't belong with us. You shouldn't be here because you're a gringo. And so this experience really started to form me 
as as a, as a person because it's the the experience that my father has had and my my mother and, and many of my family members has always been sort of embedded in me but it's it didn't really get defined until these sort of moments that sort of sparked the conversation moments of of almost a challenging of my identity and that's what created a lot of the 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 internal conflict that I had. So where was I? Where do I belong? And it's like Asher um, very um, put, puts very well. It's this inherent sense of that exile, but I couldn't put a name on it. And I don't know in in whatever your own personal experience is, but for me, having this sort of sense of inherited exile took a long time to identify. It was very much a part of what my cultural upbringing, but I couldn't put a finger on it. Where did I belong? What was I? I knew I was Pablo, and I knew that my father's history and my parents' history was very rich inside of me, but where do I tell that story? Where do I, where do I begin with that? And why is this experience inside of me so important to me? I can't let it go. I can't change my name to Paul. Um, I can't put away any of my cultural identity. And so as I began to grow into this sense of inherited exile, I, I was able to really transform my cultural identity into my creative pursuits, into my art, into, in a way that I was not worried about changing anything. I wasn't questioning anything. And so now on this, on, on the, on the verge of this next stage of my professional career, I'm really glad that I get to have this conversation. I'm glad that we get to talk about this because as a son of an exile and as a son of a man who has lived a life that is extraordinarily complex, but also, also very much embedded into my the fabric of my being that took a long time to help figure out. So I. I'm really grateful for that because we get to, I, I, I really want to be able to explore that a little bit with you. So I, I want to begin um, to, to maybe start the conversation of just give me a little bit, give us a little bit of your background, um, Bob, and then, and then we'll just engage in maybe like a, a questioning. Of, of well, it, it took a little longer than you were supposed to think, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We're going from here. Uh, <clears throat> from the days of uh, being a student to uh, <clears throat> becoming a revolutionary, to being in the banking system, uh, to work in uh, Cuba while I was studying, uh, I became involved with the what it was called the FEU, F -E -U, which is the Federation of the Students of the University of Havana, which was very active in anti-dictatorial anti-democratic uh, uh, regime, and we became also active in that, uh, in that context, uh, which was later shut down <coughs> by the regime at the time, and became later the director of uh, students, uh, which I was, was involved with a lot of activities. Uh, some were good, some were bad. The Echeverria. But continue. The Echeverria, the director of the Echeverria, what you're referring to? I beg your pardon? The director of the Echeverria. Yeah, Echeverria was my very, very good friend. Thank you. Very, very good friend. So I was part of Echeverria, mm -hmm. Juntoso Rodriguez, and the whole group of individuals. Uh, I'm probably one of the only ones that I like. You know. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> but I, came, I, I, I was studying, and I was uh, working at the same time. <clears throat> and. Uh, <clears throat> And then we we uh, we we were confronted with uh, with a new uh, with a new government uh, created by Fidel Castro and his uh, revolutionary group, which were taken over completely the country uh, without any kind of uh, participation from all the people that were actually active and that actually uh, <coughs> fought very heavily in urban guerrillas in Havana. We formed then immediately, and that was the 4th of January of 
1959, when uh, Mr. Castro finished a speech he was making for about four or five hours, I remember calling my father and said, here we go again. We're back in the revolutionary status again because he had betrayed everything that we have worked for. <clears throat> then, uh, of course, after that, uh, we uh, were very active in the uh, subversive activity. I became a treasurer of the whole underground. And uh, I was uh, finally discovered uh, by one of the agents and uh, one of my my very dear friend who is not here, who is supposed to be here, Silvino Rodriguez, who was a captain of the intelligence of Castro, who worked with me, uh, told me that I was going to be apprehended, so I left the country and came to uh, Miami, my first exile. Mm -hmm. June 1st, 1960. Cuba, uh, Miami was a community with a few Cubans that had come in exile. Everybody wanted to go back and try to go back as soon as possible. They thought that it was immediately. They thought that they wanted to to, to, to have the regime fall. And uh, it was not so. But anyway, I decided to, to leave Miami. I went to Philadelphia. I was there for, for about uh, a year working in Philadelphia. And uh, soon thereafter, <clears throat> my, one of my uh, law professors, Dr. Miró, who was the first prime minister? Dr. Miro Cardona. Dr. Miro Cardona was the first prime minister of the Castro regime in 1959, and resigned because of the communist status of the government. And uh, he asked me to put something together for the declaration of uh, his presidency as the Cuban Revolutionary Council. I uh, took the liberty of uh, calling a few friends in Philadelphia, and was able to get the uh, convention hall where the uh, <coughs> Declaration of Independence of the United States was done. And we held there the uh, meeting for Dr. Miró. I introduced him. And uh, he was uh, uh, declared the president of the Cuban Revolutionary Council, which represented all the Cuban exile groups that were fighting against So in this, in this moment, this is your, you know, your first, you said your first exile. Is there, an, is there, is there a moment where you, you thought, um, I can I can get back, I can get back to the to the island. Or was there? Or did you? What 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 moment did you you you, dis, did you know that we're not we're not going to go back? Well, well, well. In Philadelphia, I accompanied Dr. Miró to New York. I was his uh, aide to uh, for all the press and all the uh, people that wanted to meet him. And uh, shortly thereafter, he told me. Uh, if you want to participate in the Bay of Peace invasion, you better leave now, because the training program is uh, almost done, and the next two or three months we're going to do something in Cuba. That's when I left and went to the training camps in Guatemala, and thereafter I, uh, we went from Guatemala <coughs> to Nicaragua, uh, got on the vessels and went to Cuba uh, with the Brigade 2506 to, uh, to uh, invade uh, the Bay of Pigs, where we fought for three days and cost the, uh, the communists over 6,000 cattle, <coughs> never being published. And, uh, and uh, then uh, we, were, we, we, did, we didn't have the air support which we were promised, so the uh, invasion failed. And we were taken prisoner and uh, spent most of the time in the Isle of Pine. And then came back to uh, came back to Miami, my uh, second exile and final. Because in October of 1962, as you probably have read, uh, there was a, uh, a negotiation and, a, and, a, and an agreement signed between Russia and the United States, which, uh, in effect, did not allow the United States to become involved in any more uh, activities regarding the deposing of the uh, Castro regime in Cuba. And that's a fact of life. So I said, you know, this, this is it. I better go back to work and forget about my revolutionary days and uh, forget about all these things. Do you, do you, I mean, can we, can we, can we talk about that, in, like, emotional feeling? Like that, what, in that, because 
you're, you're talking about knowing that that's it. You're, that's it. You are your your home. Okay, that you grew up in because you you know you spent your you know most of your your life there, knowing that that's it. That's it. I can't. I cannot <coughs> come back. I'm done. And then, so what do you do? You, can you draw from a little bit of that emotional experience at that point? I mean, that definitely. You know, uh, in retrospect, uh, when um, <coughs> when I was in prison, uh, uh, of course, uh, people uh, have several theories. And there were two main theories. One was the people that wanted to get out, wanted to get ransomed by the U.S. government. And those that didn't want to, uh, like me, because we said, if we are ransomed, this is the end. There's no be coming back. So I would rather have an invasion coming over here again. And although we might be all exterminated upon the arrival of the people, then actually coming back to exile, because if we go back to exile, I mean, everything was done. So that was my answer to that. Wow. So, you know, I, I've spent so much of my life just trying to end this discovery. And but the one thing that I have to say um, is that you, with all the things, that you, all the choices that you've made and all the, the, the terrible things that you experienced, um, in my upbringing and my brothers, who are both here, and my sister, and, and you never, never spoke hatred to me, to us. It was never about because or it wasn't like, you know, John F. Kennedy. It was never like that. It was always, you told us a story, and you, and, and you just left it at that. You didn't put a side on it. And I, re I, I admire that. I respected that tremendously. But I, I wonder if you can, you can help identify, because it's part of the conversation of what this means, you know, why, you know, we could, we could end up being very bitter um, on one side, but if you're, your own experience, you're passing this on to your, your, your children of not viewing it in a certain way. And, and, and I just wonder if you could talk about that. I, I always uh, profess uh, a democratic form of all that. And I always instill in my children and my family that not that, that anything was bitter about it, that if anything happened in Cuba, if we lost a democratic government in Cuba, it was not anybody's fault but us. We were the one responsible because we were not able to sustain the system that we had. And it was not anybody else. It was just our own doing that had that happened. So I didn't never blame the United States, never blame uh, anybody else, never blame uh, even the people that were in power. I blame ourselves for doing that and for becoming exiled. You, um, you, you told me when we were when we were talking about this, um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. We make we make choices, and you know, those choices lead us to our, our what ultimately are our destinies, right? Um, your experience in that time. That's why I asked you about. Okay, what was that experience like in 1962 when you knew it was it? That was it, you know. And now, explore that, you know. 50 years later, and look at it through that lens. Now we're having this conversation. What is that? What is that experience like now? Well, the experience is that uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, find a country that uh, would allow us to live here and to uh, and to work and to make progress and to uh, raise our families and to uh, profess the democratic uh, principles that always share. And uh, I, for my part, thought that uh, the best thing to do was to try to, uh, to help my, my family and my uh, daughters and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sons to get the best education they could get in order to be able to, to, uh, to live uh, the way they like to live and the way they wanted to and the way we, we were used to do uh, by educational process. Nowadays, you know, sometimes you don't even have to get an education in order to have a good standard. You could be uh, a mechanic or you could be something else. But I always instill the, uh, the educational process 
has a way to be able to maintain yourself, to raise your family, and to live uh, uh, an educated life. So that, that, that's uh, basically uh, what I try to do in my, my way. Do I regret that I'm not back in Cuba? No, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. Uh, would I go back? If there is a democratic government, if there is a process of, uh, of property right, if there is a legal system, yes, I would. Otherwise, I think it would be difficult for me to, to go back. So, what, I mean, what do you say to, you know, that's why I, I wanted to share that experience. And, I, and again, I'm sorry I went a little longer than I was supposed to. Okay. But, but what, what, what do you say about that? You know, to me, to me, you know, this is my. I'm sharing my a lot of a lot of my own journey. You know, that was inherited. Um, so, how, viewing your sons and how they experience things, knowing them and, share, and and knowing how they go about. You know, what what is that viewpoint for you? How do you? Um, well, idealistically, it's uh, it's, it's wonderful uh, to to think of uh, of your country and to, to perhaps be able to go back and, and visit uh, the places that you know and uh, some of the families that remain behind. But I think that that is going to be a, a very difficult uh, task to accomplish. I think that this country is made of uh, foreigners. We are all foreigners. I mean, the only people that live here were the Indians. So, uh, <coughs> We, I think Native, that Native Americans. Then. Native Americans. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think I think that that, that uh, to be able to, to to become an American like we are today and to participate in every respectful life, I think that would be to me the most important thing. I would never uh, ask uh, today in today's environment my son to become involved to go to Cuba to fight or anything like that because. That is, I don't think that's possible. That's any possibility uh, uh, of, of, of battling the government uh, of, uh, of, of, of Cuba without any uh, real uh, power behind it. And I don't think that this country is willing to do that, and never been willing to do it anymore. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, let's be an American, let's enjoy our lives. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we had this conversation um, uh, yesterday about, you know, my, you know, if if we were if we were in nine in 1961, Miami with my two brothers, and this this situation was going on, I I I know I would I I would want to. I would want to go back. I would go. I know that I would want to fight back. Now, when we had this conversation and mo mom was in the mom was in the room, she was like, "Uh, uh, nah, tú estás loco, mijito, tú no te vas a ir, you know." Um, and so it's a because she's looking at it now through this modern lens, right? So it's an in it's interesting because I'm I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated by it. It's it's the subject of my my work, you know, that you it's so beyond my comprehension what you were willing to do to take back your your birthplace to go back and then to to get to a point where you look and you say this is it it's done it's over and that to me is mind blowing it's it's a mind blowing experience because i i, I can't fathom it so for me, I'm I'm trying to get deeper in it. I want to, and I'm gonna long after this conversation is done. I'm gonna keep asking you until you tell me to shut up. You know, which he's done. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a side story about that. Uh, when uh, we came back from from prison in the, in the Bay of Pigs, and I was invited to go to uh, make a few lectures in uh, in the East, primarily at uh, at Princeton, where I have a friend, of, a friend of mine was a dean of a school for economic and political science, uh, Dr. Rola Taylor Lee, and uh, I was 
I was invited to, to be there, and I was there for a week, in various classes and lectures and so forth. And I remember because he was uh, he was uh, a schoolmate of uh, John F. Kennedy, and they they asked me if I wanted to uh, to go to Washington about a particular issue that there was uh, that was at hand, and uh, and that I could be of help. I said sure. Be and um, so I did. And they wanted me to lead a, a team of ten men to uh, to um, depose Jao Goulart in Brazil. And uh, this is a fact of life. And uh, Catero Franco did effectively depose me. And I said, no, let the Brazilians take care of Brazil. I will go back to Cuba at that time. I said, I will go back to Cuba, but I have nothing to do with Brazil. And I'm not going to go to Brazil, and I'm not going to do that. So if you have, if you have a plan to go back to Cuba, I will go back to Cuba. So that's my answer for the 1962-63 event. That at the time, I was still in the mood to do something. I don't think today uh, I'm too old, and then second, I don't think it's possible at all. So if there was all of a sudden a movement that started happening, I mean, obviously, you know, recent news being what it is, it's, it's not realistic to even make this sort of um, uh, comparison or, or hypothetical situation. So let me not even say that. Because it was just, it's just the idea of, like, if it's, if it's happening now and there's a chance to go back and to forcefully go back, you know, and, no, 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 no. <laughs> and the three of us have the opportunity to do it. And I've had conversations with, with yeah, other yeah, other funny. Bay of Pigs veterans. I've had the conversations with them. And, and, and they, they look and they say, yeah, you would probably go back because of the history that you have. And I said, well, what does that mean? And it's like, your father was a revolutionary. Your father was was involved, heavily involved, so naturally it's in your blood, it's embedded inside of you to go. And so he said, you, you would, you would definitely. Um, again, my mom's shaking her head, no, 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 no. But, but I, I think that it, 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 it's important to look at this as part of this inherited exile. I have inherited this inside. I've, in, I've inherited that sense of, of your, your identity, that sense of who you, you know, what you believe in, and that place that, you know, for, 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 I just speak with, for my brothers, that place is so foreign to us, but yet so much alive in our heads, that it's, you know, it's, it's almost like you just planted the seeds in there, and you just kind of, I've just been watering it, you know, and now it's been flourishing, and now my own creative pursuits have, given me that voice, you know, so. Well, that's a good way to express it. Okay. In writing. So you're proud of me? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just, you know, I just find, um, I just I just find it um, such, and then we'll, we'll kind of have a couple more back and forth, and then we'll just let some people ask questions, because I'm sure that you have. You know, um, yeah, that's good right Yeah, um, but I, I get very impassioned about this. You know, I mean, just like Asher, Asher said, you know, my um, my my two young adult books now uh, take place around Cuban American culture. Um, a young Cuban American kid, you know, channeling the poetry of Jose Marti to win this girl's heart and fails miserably. Um, so. Maybe you were a romantic in your past life too, and you've been giving me that inheritance too, perhaps. Uh, but the the identity of the culture of the culture is so very rich, so very rich. And there's an abuela in the story, and the abuela is in exile. It's not talked about so overtly, but it's there. And so, and then another story. It's about a young boy going back to um, to find his his father. Um, and and now this other work. You're going to be Polish uh, 
It will be an announcement soon, no? Yes. Tomorrow, tomorrow I get tomorrow will be out in Publishers Weekly where the they'll announce the deal. But uh Penguin. Penguin ran it. So but it's an amazing thing, so it, you know, so we, we give, we try, you know, I'm, I'm a dad of two young kids, and, and we tr I, you know, I try to give whatever I can for my own self to give them an inheritance, right? Because when we talk about what an inheritance is, you're, it's, a, it's a gift that you're, that you're giving, right? And we talk about inherited exile, it's not necessarily a gift, because you're not, you're, it's displacing your, yourself, but, but I have, seen what I have benefited from your experience in the, in the way that it has formed my life and my my professional career you know so there's that's the, that's the greatest gift that you could possibly get that's not even a question I'm just looking and telling you so yeah I guess we can ask some questions how do you feel about individuals who have were born uh, to exiled parents and at some point feel this incredible uh, patriotism to a place that they've never been? Um, and how, 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 would you, how would you explain that? And I guess to take it a step further, having known what so many brave Cuban men have done in the Bay of Pigs invasion, to many of those sons, of which I know several, there is a sense of inadequacy within themselves because they never had an opportunity, or I guess it's that yearning for an opportunity to be able to fight, reclaim uh, something so something bigger than themselves, an ideal larger than themselves. How, how could you, I know it's kind of a convoluted. Well, the, 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 the situation is that it's very simple. The, 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 the parent uh, would talk about, would talk about uh, what happened, how, what they did in life, how they became involved, uh, what was their participation. And uh, <clears throat> so the children took that upon them and then they became very, very, uh, if you want to call it uh, a procurement or patriotic or, or whatever the term may be. Uh, some of them, as you know, uh, went to war and went to, and went to Afghanistan and went to Iraq and uh, been two or three times, you know, and they fought there. So that would be, may have been the displacement of, of that anxiety. You know, um, Asher wrote a really great paper. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but it's it's something. But I read it to get an idea of, um, of what his perspective is. But it's but I, there's something in there that was actually read, uh, written by another scholar um, that that says you know the and she's referring to a different a different exile. But I think it's relevant to the discussion, especially this particular quote um, where she says um, call, referring to the second generation of exile is. Um, it, that they are the guardians of a pro problematic, unique, and volatile legacy. So, the that really, to me, I think speaks to what you're what you're saying, Dan. You you become rather than having to prove yourself in an act of battle or war or physical, you know, retaliation or proof for proving yourself, you become a guardian of that legacy. You become um, you hold it and you carry it forth. And your job is to hold it and carry it to the next. So I think that that's a really, um, that's a, that, I, that to me was, was really uh, instrumental in understanding a little bit more of that. And it's funny because so many younger second generation Cubans and even some third generation Cubans have very little understanding of the history of Cuba a very little understanding of not just what I <coughs> but geographically, where's what in terms of city, relation, climate, so on and so forth. So it's almost 
like this cloud of information that you're trying to decipher. I feel that, that there needs to be a little bit more clarity to me. It's my opinion. It's a way of translating our unique legacy into a creative um, or a constructive way. You know, um, I think that that's that's a start, right? Right. Well, a legacy can be both a blessing and a curse. If it, if a legacy is limiting you, or you grow up with the thought that well. You are misplaced in a way. We're born in the wrong place. I failed you as a parent. And you have to feel that nostalgia that I'm feeling. And nostalgia is defined actually as the pain of uh, absence. Because you always live with a presence of an absence. That's what you're talking about in a Cuban family or a other Cuban or other exiled families. But it, as your father is pointing out, exile can also be a blessing in a way, that legacy. And he looks around, he sees his sons, he sees his daughters, he sees them growing up in a, in a country which gives them opportunities. And he said, well, exile has been a blessing. And that's what I understand Mr. Kataya yeah. Senior talking about. But it can be also very paralyzing. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question and then, uh, Andrew will ask a question. Mr. Uh, what about the hyphen? I mean, people call themselves Cuban American or the, this hyphen, that hyphen. Does that, and the hyphen has a propensity of both connecting but also separating. So, a week ago we had a panel where a professor made a point saying, a writer, I am Cuban after living here from teenagehood till for 50 years or so, I'm Cuban, but my citizenship is American, making that kind of distinction. Do you feel that that I, kind I, of I distinction? I have the perception mm -hmm. that the, uh, the, the young people uh, want to not go back, but want to, to try to find out more about what happened. Uh, what is Cuba all about? Forget the political aspect of it. It's just what is Cuba all about? Because they, they their roots were from there, you know. Uh, while the and, and they would be pro, and the statistics proves it today that they would be pro uh, doing a deal with Cuba and lifting the embargo. All the young people. That's what the uh, the World Trade Journal and the Economy and the FIU Cuba poll. The FIU Cuba poll, which has been done since 1991, I think that the 14th iteration also um, shows the gulf that you just mentioned between the, the exilio historico and the generation that was born yeah, here. And the older people are not so, so uh, enthusiastic about it. They, they rather not. They rather not because they, they don't believe in, uh, in anything that, uh, that happened there while these these two uh, persons are alive. I don't think, I think there will be no change, there will be nothing else, which I also believe that. I mean, and maybe, maybe I think it would be good for to go back to Cuba. I think it would be fine. I don't blame anybody that goes back and forth, but they're fraud, you know, but I think that it is, uh, it is a fact of life that, uh, that uh, from what I lived through, and I lived through it in Cuba, in exile and back in Cuba. So I don't believe that anything will ever happen in there. They would not soften up any kind of relaxation of, uh, uh, for the people, uh, for the free press, or for any kind of liberty in Cuba until these two guys are still there. And that's, that's my thinking. And I respect anybody else thinking all of it. will take some questions. <coughs> It really resonated with me when you said uh, in, in 1962, 1963, um, well, this is not gonna work for me. I'm not gonna be able to come back. I'm gonna embrace being an American. I'm gonna be an American. I'm gonna raise my kids um, to be intellectuals. So my question to you is, how do you? What are your thoughts on first and second generation Cubans that come to Miami, that refuse to learn the language or embrace the culture and choose to um, perpetuate the Cuban culture in Miami? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Just that how do you feel about them not embracing being in America? 
Well, I think, I think they, they, this is a free country. They have the right to think and so act and do whatever it is within the law, you know. And I think that they, they, they live through what I've just said before, mm -hmm. that, that nothing will ever happen there until these, people, until these two guys are still in power. Mm -hmm. Nothing will happen there. After that, you get maybe through permeabilization, maybe something will happen over the next five to ten years, and then a change will, will completely uh, will happen in Cuba. But not before. But not before. He's talking about people here. In my the head. people here, the people here, uh, uh, Take your time. Uh, going back and forth. Just going back, we have we have we have uh, uh, cousins that go back and forth to Cuba, and then uh, and then uh, you can't blame it for that. You, they have family there, and they take care of the family over there, and uh, and uh, our people send them, our family send them money to them so they can leave and and, 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 and and have a little better life than what they have because there are not many things available in the mm -hmm. country, and. Uh, so uh, I respect uh, the young people who wanted to find out their roots. I wanted to go back and be maybe more uh, uh, toward lifting the embargo than the older people that do not want to lift the embargo because of the consequences. I think that is a, such a political issue that, uh, that it's very difficult to define. I myself. Uh, so not now, maybe 10 years, 10 years ago, maybe more, that, that the embargo was doing more damage than good. Because if there was trade between, there are many things that can be accomplished. And there's no trade. That, but it's such a political issue that uh, it's very difficult to, to express yourself. Pro or against, you know. Right. There's a second part to my question. So, you also said that in this country, you can choose to be an intellectual, get the best um, education possible, or you can also uh, become a mechanic and support your family. And that's not necessarily that thing. You know, you can support your family. So, my question to you is, what's what's more important to instill in your children, nationalism or intellectualism? Nationalism in what respect? Well, um, pride, pride for your country. Even though you know there's some some people they necessarily they, they can't go back to Cuba, but they are Cuban. They're not Cuban American. They're very, no, no, no. very we, are, we, are, we are American. Okay. I mean, period. <laughs> very well. And we would die for it. Well, they they what I what I'm getting at is they choose to live the the Cuban lifestyle and express their nationalism towards Cuba. Well, it's not it's not a nationalism that I think is what it is. It's it's, it's, a, it's a cultural it's a cultural identity. Okay. You know, when you refer to nationalism, you refer to that that's that's sort of giving the idea that we have a nationalistic pride towards the country itself, the government. Right, it's right, more right. of the cultural. I, I didn't mean to phrase it that way. No, 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 it's okay, but it's, but it's a good question because some people do make that <coughs> assumption that it's like, oh, are you nationalistic, you know, are you mm -hmm. Cuban by national, you know, do you feel nationalistic pride towards Cuba? No, I don't feel any nationalistic pride towards Cuba because I'm not Cuban. However, the, the cultural roots of my Cuban heritage is very much alive in me, and that's very proud. And so, you know, the question is, is that, you know, what, what do you instill in that, whether it's you know the identity, the cultural identity, not so much the national, but the cultural identity, versus the the work, which is the work ethic, intellectual, intellectual, intellectual. And, and humanistic. And and I think you know, if I may, um, the, <laughs> I'm just going to take this one. That's fine. Um, you know, it's it has it, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You know, just you know. Um, a mechanic can read Kafka if he wants to, right? I mean, it's not, it's, mm -hmm. there's no, like, you're on this side and I'm on this side. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what you do is, as a parent, you do your best to instill um, a sense of your own history, and you do your best to provide the best educational opportunities that are available to you, and you do your best 
to demonstrate yourself as somebody who is engaged in, in hard work and is engaged in an honest life and is engaged, you, know, you do your best, right? Um, it's, it's an interesting... Well, you, have to, you have to remember that education also is technical. You know? could be technical education. Of course. It doesn't have to be just uh, intellectually educated. You know? so. And so it's, it's interesting because your, his, his particular history mm -hmm. is so complex and involved and, and you know, is revolutionary and he's coming back and he's fighting this and that. So that's, uh, that piece of his own life is passed on. It's passed on to his kids, you know. Um, a, a child of, of, of Holocaust survivors, you know, is going to have a very, it's, it's going to be passed on to them. That, that sense of history, you know. Um, and so I think that that's really where the root of it is. But if you get a Cuban that comes, you know, a, a Cuban national that comes here and he, and he flees for an economic exile, let's say, for example, right? Um, the, the sense of cultural identity is just kind of like, okay, we're going to have arroz con frijoles. And that's just part of it is. But there's no, the, it's not, there isn't necessarily the historical aspect of what the cultural history of the cultural identity is. You know what I'm saying? It's more... You know, and then speaking to what Asher, the, the hyphenated, the Cuban, and the American, it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic because I often think of myself as a Cuban American, but then I but I'm American. Well, so I, I wonder mean, if you, you can say I'm, I'm an American that happens to have been born in Cuba, <laughs> right? You know, okay. and, and, that, and I think that that's the definition for most of the people that I know. Mm -hmm. You know, that that, that would, would think that way. That they are. Totally, completely, 100% American, but they have to be born in Cuba, you know? Like all the people have been born in Hungary, or Germany, or Russia, or, you know, the Philippines, Mexico. I'm not sure if I have to say it. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm, Costa Rica. I'm from Costa Rica. I feel like that's what happened. No, it's fine. Oh. I'm from Costa Rica, and then I'm an uh, expert tailor, totally. And even before coming here, I was totally, in, you know, enclosed in that beautiful country and didn't know much about all the complexity of this political problem, let's say. Um, I, as an expert tailor, I see a different culture, Cuban culture now. Like, I can see your generation, uh, and I can see the kids of your generation, which I work with most of them uh, in a law firm, uh, many law firms in downtown, a lot of lawyers, from uh, kids from your generation. Um, but today, the culture that are, the, the ones that come now from Cuba, it's a totally different culture. It's the, the re I think the regime had transformed the Cuban culture in a totally different thing. And this is me from outside. Um, you think, uh, you know, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, incidentally, I have a daughter that lives in Costa Rica. Ah, okay. <laughs> Three grandchildren. Oh, my God. But, uh, <clears throat> absolutely, uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, important to, to acknowledge mm -hmm. the, the fact of, of, of these people that, uh, a few and that coming here, which are have a completely different uh, um, education, uh, style of living, um, way of acting, uh, because they had lived uh, through 50 years in a country that uh, the monetary system that existed was a barter system. I work in a factory of shoes and this work in the factory of uh, tobacco and uh, in order for me to get tobacco I steal some shoes and give it to him and he steals some tobacco or cigars and gives it to me and it's a trade. And that goes on and on and on and on in most of the country. It's incredible. In other words, this uh, regime, this communist regime has prostituted the Cuban people within the country. Not all not all, but many of them, because they live out of water. They live out of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 
taking things that were not theirs mm -hmm. and, 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 and changing it with somebody else in the same way. And this is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So I hope I no, answer. No, thank you. Dr. Schwartz, given your uh, passion for freedom and freedom of thought and everything, during your lifetime in Cuba, did you ever feel, I don't know, comfortable at home, or did you feel like you were sort of an internal exile under Batista? I mean, how did you, did you go from like kind of one? Well, when I was in Cuba, I felt like a Cuban, and I, <laughs> and I did everything I could to depose to whoever was in power that was not a democratic government. Exactly. And I was also, in, I was also in prison under Batista. Does so, that make you feel alienated is what I'm saying? No, I'm not alienated though. I'm, 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 when you were with, when I, you were there, I have friends with uh, Batista's uh, people. When you were so there. No, he's saying, he's saying, did you ever feel because you were in constant, or not maybe in constant, but for a good period of your life, in, while you were in Cuba, you were in you were in combatants with existing governments. Did you ever feel that you did not? Um, did you ever feel that you were in this sort of internal, internalized exile of? No, no, I was not. I was in Cuba. And I was doing my best to get rid of the people that were about. It's like having, you know, not believing in a particular leader and, you know, saying, you know, you know, if we don't like a, a political leader, right. it's, it, you know, we don't, I don't, yeah, if I don't like a political leader, I don't necessarily say, okay, I'm not that American or I feel like I'm in exile right now. Um, but there are moments that you can be afraid and you can say, where's, where, you know, what is this? What's going on? I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's, you know, that's I'm not telling you how, I mean, but I think that's maybe. Yeah. More questions? All right. I'm sorry, I have one so more. Family affair. <laughs> okay. It's an opportunity to ask questions that we have. Yeah. Right. When you were at Playa Hito, when you were. Playa Hito, by the way, is, is, in case anybody doesn't know, sorry, is, is, um, was the Bay of Pigs um, invasion, like that whole Bay of Pigs invasion. And you were engaged with other Cubans, regardless of, and I, and I can understand that in combat, I mean, you're not really caring about the other person's sentiment necessarily, but in that moment, did you ever, perhaps maybe when you were being transported, perhaps maybe when you were actually, did you ever have a moment where, before landing, the anticipation to landing on the beachhead, to whatever, did you ever have a moment where you were, you are fighting? No, it was, it was very Follow sad that you had to brother. fight your own people. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's like in a basketball game, we can be uh, brothers, and uh, when we go to the to the game, you know, I want to win, and you want to win. And yeah, but there's, and, uh, there's death involved. Football hasn't gotten that bad yet. <laughs> It, it's a similar aspect. It's a similar aspect that that uh, we we had uh, a goal to meet, and that's what we were. Was doing. there any apprehension? I mean, even in engaging. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Can I? I'm gonna. I'll share because I'm actually deeply engaged with a lot of conversations with a lot of these veterans, and I'll, I'm gonna share a, a, an interesting story about this. Um, so, one of the the men that I've been, um, you know, in interviewing. Um, he tells a story of when they when they were all rounded up and they were taken, um, they, they were taken to be um, taken to the, which was what I guess if you say the AAA like American Airlines Arena, that's where they were taken and held for about three months, you know, and interrogated. But they were, you know, taken in trucks over there, and um, one of these guys, there was a one of the people that was with him was a famous. He was a very well-known TV actor in Cuba. Um, they call him a, a Galan, you know, which is a, a phrase. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With him, you mean as a prisoner or as He was a, a prisoner. Guard? He was a, a prisoner. prisoner. He okay. was a prisoner. And so, you know, um, this guy was a character. This guy was like, a, this guy was a character. And so they're going through some of the villages and, you know, like the, you know, the militia, Castro's militia is like parading them around to see like, you know, look at these traitors and whatever. And so a couple of the villagers come out and they start throwing like uh, fruit at them and traders and this and that. And, and Galan goes and he recognizes this woman. 
Angelos, pero María, no te acuerdas de mí? <laughs> like this, like, and it just, and her, her name was not Maria, but I'll just, you know, and, he, and she stops and she looks, she goes, ay galán, <laughs> like this, and it was, pero porque, pero como te vas a tirarme así, yo no más, and, and like, did this whole escapade of like this whole conversation, and they started giving them food after that. They started handing them food, no, no, and they started feeding the, the, the prisoners. They started feeding them, you know, and it was this, and it's an interesting juxtaposition, right? Because you have this, you're, you're physically, you know, forcefully going in, and then you have this sort of, wait a second. It's almost like this, wait, we recognize each other. And it was... That story has a very nice ending. I want to tell you a story that didn't have a nice ending. Okay. <laughs> well, there's, but there's a lot of it. <laughs> we were taken in a trailer truck, completely closed. 150 of us. Six hours, at 12 o'clock. Cuba with a hot sun coming upon us. By the time we reached Havana and they were unloading the trip, 10 of our guys died of suffocation. And I wasn't there. I say one guy's life, but I wasn't there also in that trip. So. I'm sorry to. No, no, it's. Spoil it's your, but those are the realities. I'm sorry, you know, there's. there's that, that's how cruel the thing is. There's, there's, there are, there's a reality. There are the realities that you, you, you know, you recognize somebody and you can, you know, create that sort of, and then the same instant, in that same instant, you have, you have this brutal treatment of, hum of human beings. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a really fascinating sort of. I'm sorry, I keep, keep going, so I'm going to just keep going. Well, he lived, he, he's your dad, so love other people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. More questions? Yes. Yes. I've asked the same question of, um, of Bernard Mayer. He's an actual Holocaust survivor. I asked him how he felt about um, Hitler and like the people of that generation. So I asked you the same question. How do you feel about the, the Castro family and, and just your, your feelings towards them, the emotions that you have towards them personally? No, I, I have no feeling. <laughs> I pass on that question. I have no feeling at all. Uh, not not to the family. I have very good friends in the family. Not the family. The two guys that were in power are the ones that are the culprits of everything that happened. The other people in the family are very nice people. I happen to know them personally. These are difficult issues to deal with, especially when we ask to deal about that these issues competitive. And we are not in the business of competitive suffering, so to speak. So these are unique experiences on one side, and Jessica, what we are talking about, is also unique. Of course, they have universal implications, and that's what uh, Mr. Karta is talking about. Um, let me close with one question that I have to Pablo. Uh, you're talking about the third generation now, your children, and you're so involved with the Cuban culture, the Cuban language. You are doing now a very interesting event with the Iber Iberia. Uh, the Iberian American. Uh, right, the writers you are bringing uh, to Betsy. And it's a terrific program that you are creating. You probably would not be able to create or wouldn't create if you didn't have the pedigree, the background that you have with your parents and the community here. So there is a legacy that has been passed on to you. Now you are writing, and you say that your topic is also exile in a way, uh, I think for young adults, and exile literature, uh, exile studies to a certain extent, is about giving the opportunity to inhabit the world of the other, because the exile is the other in a way. And another thing is what um, Guillermo is talking about is bearing witness, which you just did about those people who died. They need to be also remembered. So what is it that you want to pass on, Pablo, to the third generation? To my, to my children. Right. I, I think above all else, um, it's this, it's a sense of their cultural her heritage, a true sense of their cultural heritage and where they come from historically. You know, so that they can, 
you know, when you say the, the name Jose Marti, you know who that is. When they say, you know, you know, when they when they say, you know, the Bay of Pigs, they know what that is. Um, when, when they know that their grandfather, you know, you know, left his country, that they understand what that is, and it's sort of it, it becomes like a guardianship that I can mm -hmm. pass on um, in the best way that I can. And I'm, I'm fortunate. I have a I have a, a night. I have a I've been very lucky. I have a platform to be able to do that, um, and I'll continue to do it and and, and help. And, and you know, and, and help do the best I can to, you know, give that um, identity to my, to my. So you basically are saying you were enriched as a result of being born into a family of people who experienced displacement, disposition, dis dispossession, severance, and you also want to pass on something to your children, which in a way, if I understand you correctly, will enrich their existence, which will give them a sense of an inheritance that does not necessarily mean to go back to Cuba, but to gain knowledge into the world of their grandparents, of your world, and make the world a little better too as a result of it. Yeah, I mean, physically going to a place is, <coughs> is, is a fraction of, of your understanding of your identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that you know the way that you know it, it's it's really digging in and, and and exploring the depths of where you come from um, in, internally. You know, you mine the field of your own yourself, right. and then and and, a, and then a physical place becomes arbitrary at that point. You know, because you're discovering yourself, and by by proxy, you, you learn things about your own cultural identity. Um, and yes, I'm very fortunate. I have, I have, you know, a father who who is a historian of his, of life and of, has a very unique experience. Um, and you know, my mother and my family, they we, we all share in this sort of history. Um, and you know, I think that hopefully, hopefully, we can continue. You know, and that makes you American. I am very American. Dr. Bauer, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank the English Department, Dr. Gillespie, and I want to thank FIU for having us here and having the opportunity, Father and I, to talk a little bit about our experiences in exile. And I hope it will serve as a uh, some kind of reference in the future for your studies. I think when I talked about Pablo and the enriching experience that he will also give to his children and you gave to them, I thought about it within this context. For us, it has been an incredibly enriching experience to have you here, to have Pablo here. And this is just the beginning of a conversation because this topic is inexhaustible in a way. The more we talk about it, the richer we become. So it's a gratitude to you and to Pablo for being here with us and for generously sharing your thoughts. And we hope that we'll have another opportunity to have you here and more students and more faculty will be able to be exposed to you. So thank you so and, much. And you only shut me up once. You only got mad at me once. It's perfect. Well, 